On the eighth day of aircraft, I bring you a space plane. That is actually really easy to fly, and it's the best I've ever done with one. Of course, this on its own cannot get to orbit. This is designed in the style of Dream Chaser, and I believe another uh, other couple things where you launch it vertically on the top of a rocket, and then uh, even inside a payload fairing to keep it from... Uh, you know, having issues with the whole aerodynamics, obviously. You don't want your center of drag to be above your center of mass, which is a problem with adding wings to the top of a rocket. But anyhow, I forgot where I was going with that. It, it Basically, relatively large payload bay for a small size, easy to fly, uh, can land on its own. Uh, has a surprisingly high delta V. I believe the delta V rate now, yeah, it's giving you the surface delta V readout right now, but actually in the vacuum, it has enough to go on interplanetary missions. And this is without a full fuel load because uh, this fuel load here, balancing them to about half as much of a full fuel tank in the front to a full fuel tank in the rear gives you the center of lift and center of mass very close to the center of the payload base so that it's very easy to balance even when adding a payload. There are clipped in extra fuel tanks on the back here so that keep that in mind. However, um, in theory you could increase the priority on this tank and have this fuel drain first. I just, I don't like having to manually pay attention to the fuel drainage, which is why I don't do that. And as you can see, this says it's the Hope 2 test vehicle. There was a Japanese space plane design called Hope, and that's what this is inspired by. I made another prototype vehicle that was very bad, and that was what I called the Hope, and so this one became the Hope 2. But like I said, that's a test vehicle, and so the test vehicle is it on a very small rocket, and this is designed to demonstrate its capability in terms of landing. So, here we shall demonstrate that by taking off vertically, as one might assume a rocket would do. And of course this also tests a somewhat similar configuration to how it is intended to be used. You put it on top of a rocket, and as you can see, that's going quite well. Now, of course, if I were to maneuver at this stage, there could be potential issues, but there aren't in this particular case. Oh yes, it also does have fuel on board, because I wanted to test it landing heavy. In this particular case, I wasted some of the fuel, but it is still sufficient to demonstrate that it can land heavy. I've also tested it with a full ore tank in the center, as well as uh, something else. I believe it was another fuel tank that I also put in there as well. So it is definitely capable of landing and controlling itself with a full fuel tank. In this particular demonstration, I'm going to try to gain some distance from the runway and then turn around and come back to land on the runway because this thing is surprisingly flyable, unlike the space shuttle that practically flew like a brick. In other words, didn't. This has surprisingly high lift, partially because it's using Mark II parts. Actually, probably entirely because it's using Mark II parts because they give a very good lifting body effect in KSP and that's kind of what I was going for, so that is indeed what I went for. And of course this does have a probe control, so you don't have to worry about risking Kerbals in the event that something goes wrong. In that way it's a bit more similar to the... Uh, what's what's it called? The What's the name of that one that the US Air Force has been launching? I don't remember. They've They've been launching a secretive space shuttle for quite a while. It's uh, uncrewed, similar to this. I think it spent three years in space once. They wanted to test uh, long duration damage, deterioration, if there'd be any failures, that sort of thing. And also just, you know, turns out being in space is pretty extreme on pretty much anything. So, of course, that is something to watch out for as well. Now I'm going to come in for a relatively smooth touchdown. That was not quite what I intended. I'm going to let it bleed off just a little more speed. You don't want to hit the ground too hard though. The one downside to this design is that it can and will flip over if you're not careful with the way you come in for landing. I'm going to go ahead and engage the steering and have this drive itself right over to the SPH because why not? Let's turn off the SAS. We don't need it at this point. We are very securely on the ground. It has a wide enough stance on the rear landing gear to handle most perturbations in landing, but not all, which is why I recommend you be very gentle with landing it. But also, you do need to land it at around 40 meters per second, even though it can glide, or actually around the speed that I landed it here. I believe it was 40 meters per second, but I'm not sure. 
you need to land it at around that speed, because if you go slower, you have a higher chance of bouncing, and when you bounce with this craft, you lose parts. Typically only the RCS ports, because they are the most exposed and lowest impact tolerance parts on it, but it is possible to, of course, lose more than that. In any case, parked ready to go into the SPH if they ever open this door into the void. I don't have a full launch vehicle for it, but it is most assuredly ready for space operations. Thanks for watching, and as always, I'll see you on the ground testing a space plane in the atmosphere only. Because it's a space plane. Why would you test it in space?